You know how you get a text alert from the delivery driver before your food arrives, so your hungry kids stop freaking out? Vonage does that. Hi. Hi, welcome to the next talk. End-to-end uh, -end industrial IoT with Azure. Today the speaker will be Poonam Sampat. Uh, She's, she's a cloud solution architect at Microsoft. Let, let's welcome her. Thank you, Ivan. Let's get started. Um, I'm just uh, sharing my screen. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, good evening, all of you. I hope you're doing good. Before I even start the presentation, I would like to ask you a question. All okay with you guys? All of you doing well? All your family is doing good? Okay, good. Let's get started. So I'm Poonam Sampath. I'm a cloud solution architect uh, at Microsoft. I focus on data and AI. And today I'm going to be talking about how you can build an end-to-end -end industrial IoT analytics solution on Azure. A little bit of housekeeping. So you, you can always post your questions on the comments window. And anything that's an aha moment or any feedback that you would like to give me, please put it in the comment section. So let's start going. So I was just thinking about, uh, you know, how do I compare IoT and the pre-IoT world? And this is something that came uh, very close to it. So you can see that it talks about how before the IoT, there were squiddles, right? So what this is really trying to depict is, at a factory le level or a floor when there were issues, a technician would be called and he would see these squirrels out there and he's like, okay, I think the system needs an update, right? So this is how today's IoT also works. Well, not like squirrels, but what it's doing is these are sensors and they're capturing data at second and sub-second speed. And it's really giving us that heartbeat about that entire plant or refinery. Using that, we are able to do uh, predictive maintenance. We are able to say when failures will occur and many, many more things, right? So uh, with this, let's get started. So in terms of the agenda today, I'm going to be covering these topics, starting off with what is Industry 4.0? Um, what is a typical architecture on, you know, from an industrial IoT perspective that you can build on the cloud? I have a very great example about a wind turbine optimization. This is an end-to-end -end demo, and I think uh, that will put everything into perspective. Um, I have the last section reserved for question and answers. And I, as I said, let's make it interactive. Put in your comments, your aha moments on the chat window in the comment section, and I'll be happy to respond, right? So in terms of takeaways that I expect you guys to take away from this session there are three the first is how can you architect an iot analytics solution on azure the second is what are the building blocks where can you get started and the third is benefits of building on azure on the cloud really now jumping in uh, you know i think you all would have heard the keynote session by dr lao who spoke a lot about industry 40 and how python is helping how python is helping with the industry 40 motion and if you go and look up any search engine you will see this definition and you know it really means that industry 40 is going to help factories become smart now why do you think why factories want to be smart Again, I think there's a three factor uh, answer to that as well. The first one being that, you know, factories want to remove any inefficiencies, make their plants, refineries more efficient. The second is co cost optimization, obviously. And the third that we're seeing is when I'm working with my customers is that 
many new business models are coming out when they are adopting industry 40 so as you know industry 40 is not just about iot sensors or analytics or big data it's a lot many things like additive manufacturing ar vr there's lot of these combinations together that makes industry 40 now i was trying to look up that okay industry 40 exists from a long time what are the industries that have benefited from this industry 40 paradigm and this is what i read in a mckinsey publication which said that an african gold mine when they were able to collect more sensor data they were able to increase their yield by 3.7% which helped them increase their bottom line year on year by 20 million dollars now that's a lot of impact and here you see why companies and you know factories are trying to become smart now as developers as python developers why do you really care about this industry 40 or this industrial iot analytics right so if you see there's a big market opportunity in 2021 we're talking about 76.7 usd billion us billion us dollars in 2026 it is projected to be 106.1 billion us dollars right so there's a lot of market opportunity and your folks are already doing some amount of python now to actually become this end to end stack developer for iot what you need to acquire is these iot skills you need to understand a little more about sensors about um protocols about the edge how do you communicate with them and how do you really do analytics the data engineering and data science aspects of it and i also read another report that said that this projection that you're seeing most of it is going to come from the apac region that's where we are right so you know it's i think it's the time where we upskill ourselves you know know certain things add on new things and then be, being that iot expert i'm sure many companies will be after you and not only that right i feel that many um, startup solutions can come out of this uh, thinking as well so <clears throat> let's move on so this is uh, a typical reference architecture when you think about implementing industrial iot on azure right it looks very overwhelming let me break it into smaller components so if you start from the left over here now when you're thinking about these sensors right it's not just one sensor there are hundreds and hundreds of sensors in a factory floor or say in an uh, let's take an oil and uh, oil and gas plant right so the end product may be petrol but the, uh, the other but there are many other byproducts that are generated and you know you need sensors at all levels in the furnace because you really want to cap capture what is the temperature what is the pressure volume so that the mixing is happening right the byproducts are at the right state and things like that so i think this is something that factories have already got it right they do generate you know uh, taken such data from the sensors but today what they do is they put that data into plccs or databases cada systems or historians okay so these are specialized databases if you may, if i want to uh, simplify it these are specialized databases to store time series data now why are they specialized because you are collecting data at uh, every second maybe sometimes at sub second speeds and you're collecting it every day 24 by 7 so imagine the huge volume and frequency of data we are talking about at least one terabyte of data uh, you know when you're talking about a generic platform if you're talking about the petronas or the exxon mobiles of the world that's even more higher right so this is an on-premise system and what i've noticed is that these on-premise uh, historians typically are air gapped what this means is they don't let that data go online that is on the cloud or in the public space right on public internet now this is where this middle layer comes in and this is what uh, microsoft or azure has built these are iot edge installers so what we saw working with multiple customers is that there is a typical pattern that exists and typical modules that anybody and everybody who wants to do analytics over the cloud of these historians will need for example you see this uh, 
OPC publisher over here, right? So this is nothing but a dockerized image. And what this does is it converts the uh, data from these historians into a JSON format, a compressed format, such that the cloud uh, can consume it. And if you see uh, in terms of the cloud, the cloud understands more modern protocols like AMQP, MQTT, or HTTPS, right? They don't understand a lot of these um, OPC UA standards and things like that. So you need that converter and publisher to exist. So these are all uh, you know, Kubernetes or Docker images that are available. You just have to install it on a uh, Windows or a Linux box, right? Now, similarly, you have something called as OPC Twin. Now, this is for you to manage these sensors, devices, uh, discover them, register them, and you know maybe push in some software ab updates and things like that. So we covered two aspects of the architecture. Let's move on to the right-hand side, right? This is where it gets interest interesting. This is where now the, the data is coming on to the cloud. So think of it this way. You have lots of data, one terabyte of data coming in every day. You want to consume that data, process that data, and you know do some analytics over there so that you can take a business decision, right? So we have on the cloud, we have many PaaS services. Now, pa what is a PaaS service? It's platform as a service. Uh, and what does that really mean? It means that instead of developers really understanding the nitty gritty of the uh, service on how should I do the compute layer, how you know how does Spark work and things like that, they just have to uh, think about their business logic and the underlying details are taken care by the cloud, right? I will show you an example when I do the demo. So the first service that we have is the IoT Hub. This is again a PaaS service. Now what this does is it ingests all this data that is coming in from sensors, takes it in, and also acts as a bi-direction communication channel, pushes data back to these sensors as well. So this is where IoT Hub comes in. So what have we done till now? We've gotten all the data. Now, once you have the data, what can you do? There are two things that you can think about. The first one is hot warm path analytics. What this really means is when you've got so much of data, you want to visualize all these uh, these sensors and see that, OK, how is my floor performing? Um, you know, are the, are the sensors giving in the right data? Are my curves looking right? All that kind of operationalization, you know, details like, for example, a, a floor manager or someone uh, at the management layer wants to see, OK, how is my factory performing today? This is where you, you can come and see in real time all the data and all the sensors, uh, what kind of data are they emitting? <clears throat> so that's the uh, warm path analytics. Now, the next thing that we have is cold path analytics. This is where comes in the machine learning use cases. Over here, again, we have multiple services available like Databricks, Synapse, Azure Machine Learning, Azure Functions that you can use to really do machine learning on the data that is coming in. I'll show you examples of what a typical machine learning use case looks like when it comes to IoT data. And the last uh, piece to the puzzle is the data lake storage. So think about it this way. You have terabytes of data. Over months, it will become petabytes of data. I want to store this data, but in a cheap format. I cannot afford to have a database, and I really don't need a database to store this kind of data. So we have a data lake uh, storage Gen2, which is an object store. And this is where you store in your raw data. right? So. This is the architecture broken down into what is on premise, what is on the edge, and what is on the cloud, right? Now, one thing that you can see, you know, with the architecture diagram and with this slide as well, is that Microsoft supports you in every step. So the way it starts is the IoT computerization. Uh, you know, remember the OPC UA server that I was talking about. So how do I get all of that? So that's step one. We have IoT Edge modules. Remember, I was talking about the publisher, discover, uh, you know, dockerized images that you can install. So that's point two. You have IoT hubs, IoT Central. Then you have Azure Machine Learning. And using all of this, you can build your product, right? So this is how Microsoft can help at every step possible. Now, <clears throat> let's get into the IoT world, right? So. What are IoT data challenges and why are they different from any data challenges, right? So talking about 
uh, the first thing is that the data volumes, I think I touched upon it also, that the data that is coming in is coming in at that high frequency and high volume. So you need something to be scalable to take that data in, right? That's the challenge one. The second challenge is the data processing itself. So uh, when you are getting this um, time series data, <coughs> when you're getting this time series data really, um, think, uh, you know, imagine a real world scenario wherein you're getting subsequent data, but you really need to uh, uh, aggregate that data at an hourly level. And not only that, you may get some data which is off that window. So, for example, you aggregate the data and say, this is the last hour of data that I got from all my sensors in my factory floor. Now, fortunately, unfortunately, some sensor may be down and it will wake up after one hour and start pushing old data because it's collected that data. Now it's connected to the Internet and starts pushing in that data. So now you have to really fit in late data into this one hour window as well. So how do you do that? That's a very typical challenge when it comes to real time data analytics. Now, the third challenge that we have is there are many personas who want to access the data. It can be a data engineer. It can be a data scientist. It can be a business user. It can be a manager. So we have huge volume of data and you really cannot replicate that data and keep that as different silos. You need that common data models or common place from which everybody can access that data. The fourth uh, important thing is that since the data itself is so huge, your machine learning models as well needs to be scalable. So when I say scalable, it needs to be distributed and helps you make that decision. The fifth most important thing is cost reduction. Uh, doing all this on an on-premise system has a challenge because in an on-premise system, you need to really procure your hardware upfront, which is a challenge in itself because you don't know how much the scale is going to be. Today, you know, you are uh, having 10 sensors. Maybe the factory thinks that, hey, this is going well. I'm going to put 100 more sensors. Now you're going to get so much more data. So you need that scale and you don't want to pay up front so that's where the cloud comes in and in the cloud when i'm showing you the demo i will also show you that every service has free tiers and from where you can scale up as the need arises so this is typical data challenges and where and how you think about them now i spoke about the iot architecture right now when it comes to uh, you know the data architecture let's double click on it when you think about the data architecture what are you doing first you're collecting the data from different sources then you're processing that data you're normalizing harmonizing that data you're storing it remember i was talking about the hot path and the cold path analysis so you're storing it into a data lake or you're actually using some other service to actually uh, you know, push that to the next layer. And then you're doing analysis. So it's a fourth wronged approach, collect, process, store, and analyze, right? So this is, I'm getting into specifics about the data pipeline per se. Now, uh, when you think about the data architecture, this is how you would think about it on the cloud on Azure. So I said, you're getting in sensor data, it can be uh, semi-structured data that would go in through your Azure IoT or event hubs. This is real time data coming in. Now, when you're getting sensor data, you also want some metadata to come in. You want to know, OK, what does this sensor mean and where is it hooked on to? Is it uh, hooked on to, say, uh, components of a plant A, things like that. So this is metadata or, uh, you know, a batch data that is coming in. So we have different services to cater to that as well. You have Azure Data Factory. Now you have the data in, you've performed the ingestion layer. The second is the storing the data. As I said, you will always store the data in your data lake storage. And then you move on to prepare or process that data. I'm using Azure Databricks. You could use Synapse Analytics. These are all past services available on Azure. I will show you when I get to the demo. And once you have process the data you want to deploy and created a model you want to deploy it somewhere so that folks start consuming that model so that's where azure machine learning comes in and that's how you can use it for serving now the other thing that you could do is you could use power bi to actually visualize your data so think of this as the end-to-end -end data architecture 
uh, for analytics or for IoT systems, right? Okay, uh, I hope I've made it clear till now. Till now, we spoke about Industry 4.0. We spoke about why you should care. We spoke about the end-to-end -end architecture. We double-clicked on the data architecture. So now I'm going to really show you uh, a use case, a live use case, so that all this comes into perspective, okay? For the use case, I've taken the example of a wind turbine. Now, uh, you would have seen a wind turbine, right? And a wind turbine, uh, typically when you're having this wind turbine or a wind turbine farm, the goal or the challenge uh, for the operators or for folks mining that wind turbine or mine timing for the farm itself is to maximize utility. That means they want to have the maximum power output and minimize downtime. So as you try to get maximum power outcome, you're, you see a wear and tear that is happening in the turbine. So now you want to get into a balance and optimization wherein you've hit the maximum power output at a given time and the minimum, the downtime or the wear and tear happening is at the minimum, right? Because if you move even one side of the equation, either your power output will be very high, which is good, but your turbine will start stop operating after some time. And if you you know if you're not using the turbine well enough, then again the the life of the turbine will be high, but the power outcome is not going to be good. So you need that balance, and that's how that is the problem that a wind turbine uh, farm faces constantly, right? So let me translate this into more technical details and then show you how to build this solution, right? So what are the goals that we have over here? The first is how do I build that ingestion pipeline? Remember, there are you know many sensors that are there on these turbines. You need to get all that data somewhere. You want to process that data. Remember, it's time series data. You want to uh, batch it and then uh, account for late data coming in and things like that. So you want to automate that processing pipeline. The second thing that you want to do is you want to predict the power outcome, uh, power output, right? So you want to create a model that helps you uh, predict the power output, which maximizes it, obviously. And the other thing that you want to create is a model that helps you predict the remaining life of each turbine. Now, once you have these two models, you want to optimize it so that you're maximizing the total profit. So these are the broad goals that any business user will come and tell you that, hey, I have this challenge and this is what I want to do. So let's see how we can attain uh, these uh, you know, goals really. So the purpose of this exercise, what I did is I don't have IoT sensors with me right now, nor do I have access to a wind turbine. But what I've done is I've simulated data and the data is of two kinds. One is the weather sensor data, which has temperature, humidity, wind speed. And the second type of data is the turbine sensor data itself. So it has a device ID, it has an RPM and an angle to it. So the first thing that I've done is simulating the data. And the second is I'm processing the data, right? So I'm aggregating the data to an hourly level and then I'm enriching that data so that I can get the weather data and turbine data together and do analytics on top of that, right? So let me go on to the demonstration. I think then life, you know, it will be these concepts, the theory that I spoke to you will become easier, right? So let me quickly jump to that. Yeah, I hope you all are able to see my portal. For folks who've uh, not used Azure anytime, this is the Azure portal. Uh, you know, you can log into portal.azure.com, create a subscription, and you're good to go, right? So, so remember for our uh, wind turbine use case, what did we have to do first? We had to create that IoT hub so that we can ingest the data. So you can go over here and type in IoT Hub. Remember, I was telling you, this is a past service. So you can just go click on the Create button. Right Now, it's going to ask me some details before I can get an instance of this IoT Hub. It's going to ask me, what is the resource group? Now, what is a resource group? A resource group is just a logical container. So all the services that you create sits within that, right? 
So I'm going to just use an existing one. And it's going to ask me, OK, give me an IoT hub name. Right. So let me just give it our name. This is how you would reference that IoT. And you can actually deploy this to multiple regions. Right. So, for example, if your farm, wind farm is in South Africa, you will deploy this IoT hub in South Africa because, you know, it's easier to get that data in that geography. Right. So that's what it's asking me. Now, other things that it is going to ask me is, do you want this service that you're creating? To have a private endpoint or do you want that service to have access to public internet depending on the security appetite you would choose one over the other and then so i was telling you one thing when you're using the cloud it is about having the freedom to pick any tier that you want so if you see over here you can start with a free tier and go all the way to standard tier so obviously the features will differ but um, the features remain the same just that the portion of what you get will differ. So for example, in the free tier, I will be able to process X number of messages. In the standard tier, I may process X square or X cube kind of messages, right? So that's how it is. And then uh, you go ahead and just say review create, right? Uh, in the interest of time, I've already created an IoT Hub instance, right? So this is how my, once you hit on the create button, this is how it looks like. Now for the demo, I've been playing around with IoT Hub a lot. So you can see it's telling me how many messages came in and what hour and things like that. Now, what is of interest over here is how can I connect to this IoT Hub? So one thing that you guys would have noticed that I don't care internally is IoT Hub using Kafka. Is, how is it getting the data? I don't care. I just want to know how do I connect to this IoT Hub? And that's where you have built in endpoints, right? So this is how you know it would provide you a connection string like a database would provide. And you use that connection string to connect to that IoT hub. So once I have this IoT uh, hub created, now I need to pump data in, right? So what Microsoft also provides is a simulator. This is a web uh, simulator. And what I've done is I've written some code here. Remember, I was trying to simulate to uh, kinds of data. One was the weather data and then was the turbine data. So I've just uh, put in some code over here, which is trying to put, you know, push that kind of data onto the IoT hub. And this is the connection string that I have copied over from the IoT hub instance. I can just go and say run. And if you see, it will start sending. See, it's it started sending messages to IoT hub. It's sending the weather data. It is sending me the uh, you know, device data and things like that. So this is how the data is getting into the IoT Hub. Now, the next thing that we have to do is now the data is there in IoT Hub. I need to consume that data, process that data so that I can get it ready for analytics. So let me see how, let me show you how you can do that. So for that, what I'm using, I'm using a service called as Azure Databricks. This is nothing but a managed Spark. So folks who have done some data engineering know about Spark. Uh, this is nothing but the open source Spark with some performance optimization baked in and some beautiful features also available, right? So again, you know, when you want to create it, it's going to ask your resource group, which region, uh, what is the security you want to do, and that's it. Now, once you've created that instance, this is how the Azure Databricks uh, would look. So let me launch a workspace. I think I've already launched the workspace. This is how a Databricks uh, experience would look. So if you see over here, I have a workspace. I've imported two um, Python notebooks. And this is what I will talk through uh, as part of the demo now. Right uh, over here, if you see what I have already uh, created is I've created a compute cluster. Remember, this is internally Spark. So I'm going to create head nodes and uh, uh, worker nodes. And, you know, that's the Spark instance. But I really don't care about the internals of Spark. I just select which is the version I need and I'm good to go. Right. So let's get back to the uh, notebook. So if you see, this is where uh, you know, Python comes in and plays an important role. Um, so this is nothing fancy. I'm going to be using PySpark commands and some PySQL, uh, nothing apart from that, right? So to get started, uh, this is the architecture. We finished the ingestion layer. We're coming to the storage layer. So 
if you see over here again i need to connect to the iot instance remember i need to get data that is there in iot hub and then process that data so i'm creating an instance of this uh, iot connection right and you can see that i'm going to now start ingesting data from iot hub now the code is very simple uh, simple spark commands i'm saying spark dot read stream dot format and i'm putting in event hubs event hubs in iot hubs can be used interchangeably in this uh, scenario and those are, this are, these are predefined libraries that come in with databricks because it has a connector available to connect to iot hubs so this is how i'm writing uh, you know getting in data directly from iot hub and i'm writing it into a delta table now what is a delta table a uh, delta table is nothing but a parquet format with uh, lots more compression to it. So uh, what I'm doing, I'm reading the data from IoT Hub and I'm writing it into a data table. So you can see that the uh, name of my date table is uh, turbine raw. So the uh, you know the uh, turbine data is going into turbine raw, and my weather weather data is going into weather raw. So these are the uh, you know raw tables that I've created. Why did I do that? Is because I can now start using SQL and start querying these tables, right? So you can see over here, I'm just saying select star from turbine raw, where device ID is this, and I'm able to see, okay, how does my data look? Now this looks simple because I've run it only for one day and I've got just one day of data. Imagine this showing over a period of time. It's gonna be uh, very nice. Now, the next important thing is, remember, this data that I was simulating was at a second speed or sub-second speed. Now, when I'm thinking about analytics, I really don't have to work at that level. So what I'll be doing is I'm going to aggregate this seconds data into hourly data. So I'm going to create an hourly window. So I can say that in the last hour, I got this data. In the last six hours, I got this data and so on and so forth. Now, once I've aggregated at the hourly level, then I'm going to combine both of these data sets into one data set so that I can use it for analytics. So let me show you how I've done that. I've used the uh, uh, partitioning command that is available within uh, Databricks to partition it in and aggregate it at an hourly level. So uh, you can see the data is showing up over here. Now, these are the, uh, you know, the RPM wind speed and the, uh, uh, the device data that is coming in and the window, the, uh, the weather data that is coming in, I've put it into chunks or blocks of data. Now, as I said, I want to really uh, combine the uh, weather data and the temperature data together so that I can use it for analytics. So what I do over here is I use the merge command and merge these two data sets together. So if you see over here, the outcome of this, and you know, this is a typical PySpark, uh, queries that I've written, nothing fancy really. Uh, so if you see now, I started off the data which was independent two sets. Now I've combined it for the same date and time. I've got the RPM angle, temperature, humidity, wind speed, and wind direction, right? So now my data is getting ready for analytics. So moving forward, now this data that you have, you could actually push it into a data warehouse, and then use Power BI for visualization and go forward from there. So that's an option, and this is what it's showing over here. And another thing, remember I was telling you that sometimes it may so happen that there might be late events, or you may want to backfill the data, because when you have missing data, it's a challenge when you want to do analytics. And when you want to do analytics as well, you need to use uh, you know, a long, uh, time data so you need to have at least one year of data and that's how you are uh, that's why i'm backfilling this data over here right so this is how finally my data would look so what have i done till now i have ingested the data and then i have processed the data for analytics now let's get into the analytics piece of it right i hope you guys are with me and following me please put in comments or anything that you find interesting or not so interesting in the comment section. Now, uh, the next thing that I said is I'm going to be doing some machine learning, right? Now, uh, over here again, I'm going to be using open source Python libraries like the uh, XGBoost. Uh, you know, what is XGBoost? This is um, an ensemble model. When I say ensemble, 
you know, typically there are multiple decision trees that are used to create uh, a model and then the outcome can be used. Now, XGBoost, you could use a regressor model or a classification model. I'm using a regressor model. Remember, the outcome that I want is I want to get that uh, power output, the uh, the best power output and the best life remaining and then do optimization on that, right? So for both these data sets, I'm actually using uh, XG Booster. Okay, so before I even go to the modeling aspects, I am doing some feature engineering. So folks who are coming in from the data science world will understand this that, uh, you know, you cannot use the raw data set as it. You have to do some feature engineering to make that data science process more meaningful and to get good outcomes, right? So I've created two <clears throat> columns over here, which is power six hours at and remaining life. This is something that I'm using, using in the modeling aspects, right? Now, um, so if you see over here, um, I'm just, uh, you know, using the XGB regressor model and passing in that input data, right? So, and then after that, the same, I'm using the XGBoost regressor again for predicting the rem remaining life. Nothing um, uh, fancy over here, really. Now, once I have trained the data or trained the model using the data, what do I want to do? I want to test the data, validate the data. Now, for me to do that, I need to actually deploy this data somewhere, right? So that somebody could consume it. Now, where do I deploy? In what format do I deploy? Well, for that, we use another uh, service called as Azure Machine Learning. Now, what that helps is it helps you create that end-to-end -end machine learning uh, MLOps experience. So what I've done over here, I'll show you. I have... Uh, you know, this is how you connect to an Azure machine learning instance. And I've just deployed the model. Now, what does deploy the model mean is it will actually create an endpoint for me so that I can go and test uh, my model. That is, I can provide new inputs and call the model. So think of it this way. If you're coming from an application development background, you have a function, right? Now, how do you test if the function is working fine or no? You need to call that function and pass in parameters to test, right? That's what I'm doing over here in a vanilla uh, way. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm internally, actually, there's a Kubernetes cluster that is created, an image is created, and an endpoint is exposed. So that's what I'm trying to do or validate the model, right? So I've already deployed it. Let me show you how I can validate or test this model. So I'm just going to copy the uh, data I want to pass to the model. I was telling you that I'm using another service called as Azure Machine Learning. This is how, again, you can create it by using the create button. And I've already created it over here. So again, it's a, it's got a studio experience. And when I launch it, this is how it looks like, right? So let me show you what all it has. It's going to basically tell me, uh, you know, every machine learning run that I have is called as an experiment. So it's going to tell me, um, what are the parameters I used? What was the outcome? It is also going to add more flavors like uh, fairness. So if you see uh, more and more as the industry is adopting machine learning, we are seeing that many models are coming out to be biased. So with an Azure machine learning, it also tells you what is the fairness of that model so that you can uh, tweak the outcome and include fairness as well in the model and not skew the model. And other things like explainability and things are part of this model. So right now, I've already deployed the endpoint. Um, so remember, there were two models. There was a power model and a life, uh, remaining life model. So I have the power model here. So I told you there would be an endpoint created. This is what the endpoint is. You can go use any language to actually consume this REST endpoint. So let's test it in the portal first. So this is some sample data that I'm putting into this model to test it. So, yeah. So it's giving me an outcome of 143. Now, what does this mean is that uh, for the input that I've put in, the maximum power per kilowatt is around 143. So that's the outcome, power output that I can expect for this kind of uh, input model that we have, right? So this is, uh, this is how you uh, validate the model. So 
I have done the same thing for both life and uh, for the uh, uh, power output. And then I'm doing some optimization models. I'm not going to get into the data science aspects of it because uh, you know that's not as part of the topic today. But I want to show you at the end what was our end goal. It was to know what is the uh, RPM that I need to maintain and what will be the optimal price that I will get, right? So you can see that I have have had these multiple runs that I've done with the simulated data. And I've been able to say that if I keep the speed at 7 RPM, I would get a maximum profit of $1.2 million, right? So this is the final outcome that you have. So uh, as part of the demo, I would just like to summarize what we did, right? We started. Um, uh, with IoT hubs, we simulated the data. In an ideal world, you will have sensors and that will be pushing in data to the IoT hub. Remember that edge layer and all that, you'll have to build all of that. And then you can push that data into IoT hub. Once that data is in, I used Azure Databricks to process that data, read in from IoT hub and then go on to process it, you know, uh, uh, depending on what kind of processing you need. Sometimes it may be to deduplicate the data. It may be to uh, understand late events. How do I backfill that event? How do I aggregate, create those windows and things like that? So those were all data engineering aspects. After that, I actually created that, that data set that I could use for data science. And again, within Databricks, I wrote in some Python code and I used a normal algorithm like SGE Boost to give me these outcomes. And the end goal, I was able to go and tell an end user or the business user that, hey, you set it at this speed and you should be able to get this kind of profit. So when you're thinking about an end-to-end -end IoT scenario, these are all the aspects that you should think about, right? So getting back to the uh, presentation itself, I hope this demo, you were able to understand the architecture and what I really did as individual steps. Right now, why Azure? You saw the demo, you saw me go through all the components. What did really stand out was, for me at least, is the ease of development. I used past services, I had to just go to the Azure portal, create an instance of that service, and boom, it's already there. I just need a connection string on how to connect to it, right? Scalability, uh, I showed you for IoT Hub, there's a free tier even for Databricks. There is some free days you can use it for. So you can start using that and then based on the capacity increase and things like that, you can scale. And there's definitely auto scaling options available and you can go from a min to a max size. The third important thing is there's no upfront, upfront cost. If you see, I never provisioned a VM or things like that. And as my business grew, I could go from free tier to a, uh, you know, a paid tier and things like that. The fourth most important thing was building blocks were available out of the box. I didn't have to think about, hey, I'm getting one terabyte of data or 10 terabytes of data. Uh, you know, should I tweak my Kafka cluster this way or things like that? No, I didn't have to do anything like that. IoT Hub took care of it. Databricks was there. I had a managed Spark instance. Like a Jupyter Notebook experience, I was able to just go and use it and have things ready, write my business logic and good to go. I didn't cover upon these two aspects, but there's definitely security and DevOps that comes to play. And uh, these are all baked into all the services in Azure. So, you know, you have the world's best security at every layer. So security is not like a checkbox, right? It's not that way. So every layer from the data storage to the IoT to having access to the public internet, everything can be controlled. And uh, there is an integration with GitHub that is available. and when you do all this, you can see that I was able to build the solution typically within two days. So I can really go to market within two days. And you can see there's a lot of standardization that also comes in when you're doing things on the cloud. So with that, I would like to conclude and I hope I've been able to convey the three key takeaways. The first one is how do you architect a solution, an IoT analytics solution on Azure? Second. What are the building blocks? Where to get started? And third, what are the benefits of building on Azure? I hope these are the takeaways that have been clearly defined for you as well. These are some quick links. I can share the deck uh, 
after the session this is something that uh, you can look up uh, uh, you know the code is also available over here and the entire case study is there there are some self learning parts which you could use to get yourself acquainted with all the services i talked about and iot in general as well right with that i would like to thank you and uh, i would like to open the stage for any questions Oh, it's just nice, like 45 minutes. Okay, so the questions. Like, there, there, this, there was a question, how to access the web page Databricks? Okay, so Databricks is a, a pass service that is available, and you typically just go to the Azure portal and click on, um, you know, the studio experience, and it will take you to Databricks. So that's all it is. Yeah. There's another question asking for the tutorial steps. Yeah, I have it as part of the presentation. Maybe I can share it with Ivan and he can share it with you guys. This entire tutorial is there. There are steps around um, how to get started with IoT Hub, Azure Databricks, and also this entire Python files that I shared is available. <clears throat> So there's a question I see about the sensor device management in Azure. So we have um, uh, things like device twin and management available as part of a feature within IoT Hub itself. So as I said, you could actually um, you know, register the devices. You can also push in updates. So uh, you know, when you're at a factory level or at a floor level, you're not thinking about pushing your updates only to a sensor, right? There may be some software updates that you want to push. So from IoT Hub, you can actually send messages and updates back to the device as well. So there's a two-way communication and all those capabilities are available within IoT Hub. I like the comment about uh, Squirrel used to power server. Yeah, that was funny too for me. Anything else? Um, uh, I believe there are no more questions right now. Okay. So thank you. Thanks a lot for giving the talk. You can you can just send the tutorial and I'll share it with the participants. Sure, I'll do that. And yeah, I guess I'll end the broadcast now. Thanks a lot. Thank you and have a great evening. Bye. Take care.